All right, hey, good morning, RCC. It's great to see all of you with us today. I'm going to invite us to stand to our feet. If you're joining with us online, welcome. There's joy in this place today. We want to sing that out. Let's worship together. God who was, we worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. We worship God who brought it the raging seas. My God, He holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. Shout out your praise, there's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. He hung up on that cross. He rose up from that grave. My God still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out. Amen. Hey, welcome RCC. You can have a seat. Have a seat. We are so glad that you are with us this morning and welcome everybody who is joining us online. Uh, we are glad that you are with us online. And uh, I want to remind you of a couple of things this morning. We have connect cards that we would love uh, for you to fill out just to know that you're here. Um, so those are in the uh, pew racks in front of you. There's two ways to fill those out. You can grab one, fill it out, and drop it off either at the crosses here on the sides of the room or in the giving boxes 
on your way out, or you can just grab your phone and take a picture of that QR code and fill that thing out digitally. But we want, uh, we want to get to know you and your family. We want to know how we can serve you and help you grow uh, in your relationship with Jesus. So please go ahead and grab one of those and fill it out. Also on there is a spot for prayer, and online there's a request prayer button. So um, if your family has a special prayer need, we would love to pray over that this week. So uh, go ahead and, and fill that out, and then same thing, drop it at the crosses, put it in the giving boxes, or let us know online. Um, also, RCC, I want to thank you for your generosity, and um, you know, specifically on my mind right now is camps. We're leaving for middle school camp today with over 60 of our middle school students and uh, headed down to a camp with almost 200 kids down at North Florida Christian Camp. And in two weeks, we're bringing uh, 50 high schoolers up to Tennessee for our high school camp. And, and all of that is made possible by your generosity. So thank you so much for your giving hearts and, and spirits. And, and uh, there are multiple ways to give, and those are right there on the screen. So thank you very much um, for supporting this church and uh, the gospel growing in our community and specifically our kids. Um, as I set up our... Uh, communion thought for this morning. If you uh, need those communion elements, you didn't grab those on your way in uh, to the worship center this morning, just put a hand up and one of our ushers will bring you those at this time. So uh, this morning, as I prepare our hearts for communion, I want to tell you about um, uh, something that was written in the late 1200s by a church leader named John Duns Scotus. So John Duns Scotus wrote that God's plan from the beginning was to reveal God's self as Christ. His plan from the beginning was for us to know God as Jesus Christ. And Jesus uh, does not come as a remedy for sin, this is what he wrote, as if God would need blood before God could love what he created. So RCC in, in, um, in 1 John 4, 6, it says there that God is love. And the idea that God, who is love, would demand a sacrifice of his beloved son in order to, be lo in order to love what he created? You see, that didn't work for John Duns Scotus 700 years ago, and it still doesn't work. Jesus did not come to change God's mind about us. It didn't need changing. God has organically, inherently loved what he created from the moment that he created it. Jesus came to change our minds about God. We are the ones that waver in our love for God. His love for us is always present. So God, rather than being that um, you know, heavenly lightning bolt thrower or that ogre, you know, mean guy that we sometimes depict. That's our depiction, but it's not true. Our God is love. And in this moment, we take time to remember that together. Um, communion isn't about us doing anything to make ourselves right with God. It's all about us receiving God's perfect love for us and receiving it to our bones. It's about us taking us out of our center and letting God reign in there. Let me pray over this time. God, there is no God like you. There is no God like you. There is no God that loves his creation like you do. There, and God, we are so thankful for your great and wonderful love for us. And as we join together to receive these elements that represent the body and the blood of Jesus, we pause to recognize your perfect love for us. And God, we pray that the bread and the wine serve as a physical reminder that your love should reside in us this week. It's in the name of Jesus I pray, amen.
are still good in all of my questions you are the answer it all points to you you're the god of the breakthrough when i'm breaking down you'll be working a way through and there's no way out there's one thing i know you're still Still got a reason to praise, praise, praise yeah. Out of all wrongs, you write our story. Out of the cross, come rivers of grace. Out of the grave, burst our revival. No two. this chorus. And break through when I'm breaking down, you'll be working a way through when there's no way out. There's one thing I know, you're still on your throne. So whatever I'm feeling, I still got a reason. Amen, church. Can we give God the glory again? There's always a reason to praise. Amen. Have a seat. Have a seat. My name's Nathan. We want to welcome everyone online. We are so grateful to have you this morning, and we hope that every one of you know that we at, at RCC are all about Jesus. We're just a bunch of Jesus people. It's pretty simple. We want to continue to lift him up in everything that we do and draw 
and draw people to him and not to us. And so we are so honored to have you. If you're your first time here, we hope you feel once again like you're part of a family of Jesus people. And right now we're diving right into a series called Joyful. And so this is a, the third part of that series. And if you've missed the last couple of sessions, you can go and watch them online. You just go to riverchristian.church slash messages or, or rewind, whatever you want to do, whatever's easiest for you. And we're studying the book of Philippians. And I've been so encouraged by so many people who've come up to me and talked to, talk to them about how they're wrestling Philippians right now. I was out playing golf and I hit a bad shot and a brother of mine said, uh, Nathan, um, and I said something kind of negative about my shot. He said, Nathan, if you can't find joy in your golf, maybe you need to find it in something else. And I thought, that's really great that you're listening. That's really bad that you're listening because you're throwing it back in my face. I appreciate that, you know. That's great. So, so hey, let me ask you a question. We launch into Philippians chapter 3. Here it is. How, how many of you have read a book about success? Raise your hand if you've read a book on success. All right, whatever it may be, success in something. How many of you want to be successful at anything? Raise your hand if you want to be successful at something in your life, okay? I hope that's all of us to some degree. I don't know about you, but there's tons of resources out there. There's, there's podcasts and there's, there's a whole bunch of books you can read, tons of resources. Uh, often by times those resources come from people, though, who actually have no real life experience in said topic. Have you noticed that? In fact, uh, as a church leader, uh, oftentimes I have other people who want to consult me and consult our church and how we can be, you know, uh, even more effective for the kingdom of God. But I start looking around at what they've done. I realize many of them haven't done anything like they're talking about. They have never really grown a church. They've never really, they don't really have a lot of experience. And a lot of times that happens in these books that you, you read about from people who actually have no real life experience. And I don't know about you, but I like to find someone who actually has real life experience in that topic if I want to learn to be successful in that topic. Here's how I put it. I learn more from models than I do from manuals. I learn more from models than I do from manuals. Let me kind of illustrate this. There's a guy named Wrigley Jr. He founded the Wrigley Chewing Gum. You've heard of that. Back in 1911, he left his house. Uh, actually, in the 1800s, he left his house at age 11 and went to New York at eight, age 11 to try to make it big in New York. That's amazing. Well, that didn't work out very well. He went back home, and then years later, he went to Chicago, and that's where he made his fortune. I don't know if you know this, but Wrigley Jr. started selling soap. That's how he started selling soap. And then to incentivize people to buy the soap, he started selling baking powder. Or people really love the baking powder. So he started selling the baking powder. And to incentivize a baking powder sale, then he started selling two, he started giving actually two pieces of gum, two pieces of sticks of gum. Well, people really love the gum. And so then he started selling the gum, gum, and he got into the gum business. I would say that's a good decision, right? After 100 years... Wrigley's Chewing Gum is the most popular gum in America. Family, to be successful, you have to understand what successful joy looks like. And today I want to talk to you about those of us who are battling right now with being successful and being joyful. We need to look at a model. And to look at that model instead of a manual, we're going to go into ancient Greece, the upper part of Greece. A guy planted a church there who was successful. His name is Paul. And Paul planned this church in Philippi, and we're reading this letter based out of his love for this church that he planted. And we come across a section here in chapter 3 where Paul talks about what he considered at one point in his life to be successful in. Just like Wrigley tried to be successful in one thing, ended up being successful in another thing, Paul had the same experience except on a bigger and grander level. You can only imagine how easy it would be for Paul to say that he's the most successful Christian ever. I mean, who, is, who has had more to influence the Christian faith except Jesus more than Paul? Paul also tells us that he sought to be successful in a different way, and eventually he found his what true success really comes from in Jesus Christ. And Paul gives us a summary of his religious biography in chapter 3, and I hope you have time, and you'll read chapter 3 this week in Philippians. In the first 11 verses, he talks about his past, that he was filled with a passionate zeal for God through religion. Paul, you know, was a rising star in the Jewish faith. His parents had a beam with pride as he took on more roles of leadership and influence. He mastered every rule, every regulation. He was powerful, and he was popular, and he was all so intellectual, but yet he was intimidating. He was famous, and he was fearful at the same time. 
But all that changed one day when he's going to persecute people like you who are believers in Christ. He went to go kill Christians. And on his way to persecute Christians, he all of a sudden he had an interaction with the risen Savior Jesus Christ and it changed his life. And all of a sudden, Saul, his name was Saul, who was a persecutor of Christians, is now Paul, a preacher for Christ. Calls that conversion. And Paul's former Jewish colleagues never got over that. They began to hate him with all the passion that religion gone bad can unleash. And let me tell you right now, church, overzealous religious people can generate a lot of hate-filled passion. But Paul did not allow that to discourage him. That he did not allow that to defeat him because his view of what success looked like changed. And here's what he says in Philippians chapter 3. He says, but whatever regains to me in my former life, may I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of passing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I have given up. On baking soda, I've given up on soap, and now I find something much more successful, much more fulfilling, and that is Jesus Christ. Paul met Jesus, and his purpose changed from pursuit of religion to a pursuit of a relationship with Jesus Christ. He writes this in verse 17, Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have, have us as a what? Have us as a what? Model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. Once again, we learn more about how I want to be successful in something. Today we're talking about successfully and joyful. Be successfully joyful. I want to learn more from a model than I do from a manual. So what can we learn from Paul about being successfully joyful in our Christian walk. Number one is this. Here's what number, number step. Number one step we need to take, and that is evaluation. What does that mean? Evaluate the, it means we got to face the facts. Face the facts. When we're, we're talking about facing the facts, I'm talking about facing the facts about myself, about you face the facts about yourself. See, one of the things you have to admire about Paul is his transparency, man. He's an open book. Paul's very open and honest about his relationship with God, and he candidly says this I don't have it all together. I, I've got a long way to grow. I certainly haven't arrived, is what Paul would say. And if you're going to be successful in life, you've got to stop and take inventory where you are. Paul says this. He says, not that I have already obtained all this or have, have already arrived at my goal. Another translation says this. I don't claim that I've already succeeded or now I've become perfect. See, Paul was completely satisfied with Jesus Christ, but he was not completely satisfied with his life in Christ, how he was living out the Christ life. And when you think about that, it's an astonishing admission by Paul who shows incredible self-awareness. Because if anybody had the right to say they had it all together or they made it, it was Paul. I mean, think about it. This man wrote half of the New Testament. (laughs) I mean, he single-handedly spread Christianity all throughout the Roman Empire. He, he planted more churches. He taught more people about Jesus Christ. He endured more opposition. He trained more pastors than anybody else. At the end of his ministry, he would say this, I'm not all that. I'm not all that. See, family, the point is this. Joyful people never stop growing. Joyful people never stop growing. They're always developing. They're always risking I don't know if you know this, but if you climb Mount Everest, there's a 14% chance that you're going to die. Mount Everest has a 14% chance of fatality rate. And there was a 65-year-old man who climbed Mount Everest, and as he was climbing up the mountain, he, he died. His friends buried him, but they put an inscription there by, right there at his burial site, and it read this. It said, he died climbing. And that was Paul's That was Paul's passion. I want to die climbing. I want to die risking. I want to keep reaching. I'm not where I want to be yet. Pablo Casales is a famous cellist who who lived in Spain. He's the most popular cellist in the 19th century. They did a documentary on him in his 90s. He died at age 93. And while they're doing that documentary, they notice that even as the most accomplished celloist in the world, 
in his 90s, he still practiced four to five hours every single day. And they asked, why are you doing that? Why are you practicing four to five hours every single day? And he said this, because I'm making progress. Because I'm making progress. You know, many people quit growing because they compare themselves to people around them who aren't doing anything. I've got a lot of people close to me who think they're doing great. Why? Because they compare themselves to other people who aren't going anywhere. And if Paul would have compared himself to other people, I would tell you right now, he'd been puffed up with pride. But Paul didn't co- compare himself to people. He compared himself to who? Jesus Christ. Jesus, who is the author and the perfecter of his faith, he realized that he still had a long way to grow. You know, some Christians, and you've been around them, they kind of give off the vibe that they have all the answers, right? That they don't have any worries, they don't have any concerns, they don't have any fears, and, and they, they got it all figured out, and they have little patience, have very little empathy for people like the rest of us who are still trying to figure out how to get our act together. Those kind of Christians, I'll be honest with, me, with you, give me heartburn, okay? I mean, I, I want to just tell them, hey, spare me your delusions of adequacy. And I don't know about you, but the longer I follow Jesus, the more aware I am of my own inadequacies, my own failures, my own, my own issues. We like to say here at RCC that nobody is perfect. And that starts right here with this guy, by the way. That starts right here with me. I, I had a person come up to me a couple months ago after service, a pastor. I've had other pastors say that, uh, tell the church they were sinners just like the rest of us. But you're the first one I believed. There's a compliment in there somewhere. There's a compliment. But that's good. Paul would say, man, that's where you want to start because joyful people are honest about their faults. Joyful people are emotionally mature enough to say, you know what? I don't have it all together and they haven't arrived. So joy begins with evaluation. Then it leads to joy begins also, next step, elimination. What does that mean? Forget the past. Paul said this, he said, there's one thing I do, forgetting what is behind. Forgetting what is behind. Joy is not wasting any time being held by the power of yesterday. I don't know if you know this, but yesterday died last night. Yesterday's dead. Yesterday is over. And you have to make a choice. I will not be manipulated by the memories. I will let go of my guilt. I'll let go of my grief. I'll let go of my grudges. I will choose to let go of my past so I can be totally engaged in the present. Now, some of you right now, you're like, well, how in the world do I forget? I mean, isn't it true that the brain is, is built to remember? I mean, that's kind of a good thing, right? So why all of a sudden, why would I forget? I mean, what does it mean to forget in light of Scripture? Because forgetting in our culture, what that means is, you know, all of a sudden, um, there's a physical decline. There's a mental faculty decline, right, if I'm forgetting, I think about uh, three friends who had the same birthday, three good buddies, same birthday. They were 40 years of age. They got together, and they said, hey, what should we do to celebrate our birthday? And one of them said, hey, let's go down to Glowing Embers Restaurant because, you know, the waitresses there are young and pretty. And so they went down there and celebrated their 40th birthday. Fifteen years later, they're 55 years old. They got together and they said, hey, let's celebrate our birthday again. Where do you want to go? And one of them says, hey, let's go down to Glowing Embers Restaurant because it's quiet and it's smoke-free. Let's go celebrate our birthday there. And so 55, they went down to Glowing Embers. And then all of a sudden, 15 years later, they're 70 years old. It's their birthday again. And they say, hey, what do you want to do to celebrate our birthday? And one of them said, hey, let's go down to Glowing Embers because it's easily accessible. And now they have an elevator. (laughs) So they went down. They all agreed. Fifteen years later, they're now 85 years old. They made it. And they get together and go, hey, let's celebrate our birthday. What should we do? One of them says, hey, let's go down to Glowing Embers restaurant. They go, why? He says, because we've never been there before. Some of us resemble that, don't we, some of us? But anyway, apart from brain malfunction, what does it mean to forget in light of Scripture? I mean, there's a lot of things we wish we could forget, right? But we can't. The term forget in light of Scripture means this. It means forget means no longer influenced by, no longer affected by. So when God says to the prophet that he forgets your sins, it doesn't mean that he doesn't have a memory. It means that he doesn't treat you 
He doesn't respond to you in light of those sins. Now, I want, I want to make a very important statement here. Here it is. While we cannot change the moments right from the past, we can't change the past. We can't change the meaning of the past. We can't change the moments, but we can change the meaning of the past. To illustrate this principle, we don't have to look any further than our model we're talking about today, Paul's life himself. I mean, this guy was going around persecuting Christians. And if, if Satan would have had his way, those memories of those moments could have haunted him and could have stagnated his growth in Jesus Christ. After all, he persecuted the church. There was a time when Paul believed he was actually doing the will of God by killing Christians. The events did not change from the past, but his understanding of those events changed. That's why he wrote some incredible statements all throughout the New Testament. And I want you to show you one of those right here in the New Testament that he wrote to a, a, a young pastor he was mentoring by the name of Timothy. And here's what he wrote to Timothy. May I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has given me strength, Paul says, that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service even though I was once a blasphemy, blasphemer and prosecutor and a, and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. Man, look at this. He says, the grace of our Lord has poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here's a trustworthy saying, Paul says, that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners. Read it with me, church. Of whom I am the worst, Paul says. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, man, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. He wants to be a model. And then he breaks out in praise. Read these words with me on the count of three. One, two, three. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Listen, you can't change the moments in your past, but you can change the meaning of your past. And some of you are going, well, how in the world is that possible? Well, it's possible, he said it, by the grace of God. The grace of God. Family, the deeper our experience is with God's grace the more generous we become with God's grace. I mean, when we understand that we are all unworthy sinners forgiven by pure grace, it breaks the power of, trying to, of the past trying to control us, but also breaks us free from the power and the desire to power up and try to control other people. Because, listen, none of us are so good that we are above the grace of God. None of us are so good that we are above the grace of God. But here's the bigger truth. None of us are so bad that we're beyond the grace of God. Amen? None of us are so bad that you, no matter what you've done, is beyond the grace of God. Joyful people look at their past and they recognize and they see the evidence of God's grace all throughout their life. Even when they weren't expecting it. Even when they didn't even want it. Joyful people forget two things. Like, what can they forget? Here they forget. They forget about their failures. Joyful people forget about their failures. Joyful people do not continue to rehearse in their minds things that God has let go of a long time ago. You know, sometimes those memories of things that we have done in our past come up in our brain, don't they? They come up at the weirdest times. You could be walking in your neighborhood. You could be in prayer. You could be doing something else like washing the dishes or at work. And all of a sudden, a memory from the past comes up. And then Satan loves to initiate two weapons, two of his favorite weapons in that moment. One is guilt and the other is shame. That's Satan's primary weapons. That's why so many people stay away from the Lord because of guilt and because of shame. And all of a sudden, those memories come in your mind, guilt and shame show up, and a friend of mine prays this prayer. Maybe it's a prayer you need to start praying. It's a prayer I pray every time it happens in my life. And the prayer goes something like this. Thank you, Lord, for already forgiving me for that. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for already forgiving me for that, and I'm no longer under his condemnation. Thank you, Lord, for forgiving me for that, and now I am no longer under his condemnation. Joyful people don't just forget about their failures, though. They forget about their successes. Because let's just be honest, man. One of the hardest things to do is survive your own success. 
It's so easy to base your security on some past performance and think that you've already arrived. Timothy Keller said this, we need to remember that we are saved by grace when we fail, but we need to remember that much more when we succeed. And here's why we need to let go of both past failures and past successes. Because past failures fill me with condemnation, and they fill me with pain, and they'll make me and you feel inferior. Past successes kind of fill us with complacency and pride, and they make us feel superior. See, Jesus said this, no one puts a hand to the plow and then looks back. It's fit for service in the kingdom of God. Jesus is using an agricultural term that you can't move forward in life and be looking backward at the same time. I mean, if Jesus was telling that parable now, he would say this, no one should get a driver's license if they drive forward by looking at the rearview mirror. But that's how many of us operate in our life, and that is a dangerous thing to do because, man, if you can't safely operate a vehicle by staring in the rearview mirror as you're going forward, and you cannot be joyful by living in what in the past, no matter how devastating or how celebrated it may have been. So there's evaluation, there's elimination, and thirdly, there's concentration. What does that mean? Focus on the future. Focus on the future. Joyful people are goal-oriented. They don't live in the past, but they look forward to the future. Paul says these words, but one thing I do, man, this is one thing I do, this is what I do. Forgetting what is behind and straying towards what is what? What is ahead? I press on towards the what, church? Towards the goal. Now, let me ask you a question. If you're going to raft, if you're going to go rafting, Would you choose to raft down the Everglades or would you choose to raft down like a mountain river? Which one would you choose? And by the way, this is not a trick question. All right? Which one would you choose? Well, I hope you would choose the mountains because if you go in the Everglades, you don't want to raft there. Why? Because of these guys. All right? Not a good call. Everywhere you go, man, there is miles and miles mosquito infested, alligator infested swampland covered by stagnant water that never moves. But when you're in the mountain currents, it's all heading downhill in the valleys, and that's where you want to go rafting. That's the difference between, you know, banks and, and boundaries, the difference between these rivers in the, in the mountains and what's going on in the Everglades. The rivers that flow out of the mountains, man, is directed to a specific goal, to a destination, and because obedient to its boundaries, it provides the passengers, a rush of adrenaline, a ride of adventure that the stationary waters, Everglades, never can provide. But can I just say something about many of us and why we're not being joyful? A lot of us right now, tragically, most of our lives are like the Everglades, man. We, miles and miles of dormant water, and we're not going anywhere. I mean, we may be busy, but we're not going anywhere, And the reason why we live like that is because many of us are infected with a disease. And the disease is called fragmentitis. You ever heard of fragmentitis? Of course you haven't because I made it up, all right? What does that mean? What does it mean? It means you're trying to do a dozen things at the same time and you're succeeding at none of them. You ever done that in your life? Paul is saying that you need to figure out what counts most in life, what counts most in life, and concentrate on that. There's tremendous power in a focused life. Let me just kind of give you some insight here in case you haven't figured it out. Joy is not an accident. Joy is not an accident. Many of us kind of think joy is a matter of luck or fate, like we're waiting to hit the lottery. Like, man, you know, someday, somehow, somewhere, something's going to go my way, someone's going to come along in my life, and then I'll have joy. (laughs) And so much of the issue with not being joyful is, man, we're spread so thin. Man, our discipline's way out of whack. I think about some of the leadership principles that kind of helped me out with this. Andy Stanley said this, as a leader, you're gifted by God to do a few things well. It's not right for you to do everything. And many of us think we ought to do everything. John Maxwell says, you're most valuable where you add the most value. This seems so easy, so why don't we live a more focused life? I think one of them is because of myth. One of them is a myth of being balanced. Most of us grew up thinking, you know what? I just need to be more balanced in my life. I need to be good at everything. I need to be competent in everything. If I've got these strengths, I've got these weaknesses, I need to make these weaknesses up to these strengths. And I'm going to tell you right now, that's not how you're geared. 
You're not going to live a fulfilled life. And biographies of those who have accomplished success will tell you and dispel that myth, by the way. People who made significant contributions with their life were not well-rounded individuals. They were intensely focused people. They understood that devoting a little bit of themselves to everything means committing a great deal of themselves to nothing. Another thing we need to understand is we fail to distinguish between authority and ability. Many of us have authority over areas where we have little ability. I mean, we exhort our authority in an area we lack ability, and we can derail projects, and we can also demotivate people who possess the abilities that we lack. For instance, as a lead pastor, I have several, I have several things that are under my authority, but I'm going to tell you right now, you don't want me running the women's ministry. All right? My wife, would, that would drive her crazy if I ran the women's ministry. You don't want me running the kids' ministry. The ambulance would be here all the time, all right? It'd be a boot camp is what would happen. We would shrink this church so fast. It reminds me uh, uh, about the captain and the chief. They're butting heads about which one of them can, it means the most to, the, to the, the freight ship. Is it the captain or is it the chief mechanic? And they got such a heated argument about who's the most important that they decided to switch roles one day. And so the captain went down to the engine and the chief mechanic went around from the engine up to the bridge. Well, all of a sudden, after a few hours, the captain's down the bottom, and he's just struggling with the, with the engine, trying to get everything to run. And finally, he comes up to the bridge, and he's covered in all the grease. And he looks at the, the chief mechanic who's driving the ship, and he puts his head down, and he's kind of sighing. He says, I guess you're right, chief. I did my best. I can't make her go. And the chief mechanic who was driving the ship says, I know you can't, captain, because I ran her aground. And many of us don't realize, man, we flourish in our wheelhouse. And to have an endless joy about us, we have to have an evaluation, we have to have elimination, we have to have concentration, and finally, we need to have determination. And what does that mean? Determination means this, fight to the finish. We fight to the finish. Almost nothing in life happens without effort. And the only way you coast is when you're heading downhill, right? Right? And notice how Paul does in what he says in Philippians chapter 3. He says this, straining toward, I press on toward the goal. Now you can feel the intensity with those words. When you look at the original meanings of those words, he says, I'm overextend myself like a runner. A runner who's heading across the finish line. And every fiber, muscle in his body is firing off right now. He'll even dive across the finish line to finish the race. Now let me point out a couple things here. Paul's not talking about doing something to earn a place in heaven someday. He's talking about a deliberate effort that he's making to allow heaven to live in him every day. He wants heaven to live in him. I love what Dallas Willard said. He said, God is not opposed to effort. He is opposed to earning. He's not opposed to effort, but he is opposed to earning your salvation. Gospel writers are clear. There is nothing, there is nothing you or I can do to earn our salvation. But we are to do what we can to grow in our faith. There's no way you can earn it. It's a gift. It's given to you by Jesus Christ. Second thing is, God is more concerned with the direction of your life than the speed of your life. If we all would love to be further along, Paul would love to have been further along and go faster in life, but he was more concerned about what direction am I heading? And he says this, I won't quit. I won't quit until I take hold of that which Christ Jesus has taken a hold of me. There's a danger in speeding your life, trying to speed your life through, trying to climb up the ladder above everybody else. Because when you're trying to give up above everybody else, I'm telling you right now, you go right past Jesus. Because he's coming down the ladder to try to get a hold of you. And that's exactly the phrase here that Paul is trying to capture. Jesus has taken a hold of us, so we take a hold of him. That's the ultimate success in life. Let me give you a couple of models. One's not a good model, one's a good model, all right? Bad model, good model. Rennie Alcorn talks about these two guys when he goes to Egypt one day and he sees two grave sites in Egypt. And one of those grave sites he went to go visit was a guy named William Borden. 
William Borden's an amazing man. He was born in 1887. He died in 1913. He was a wealthy man. He, he was inherit a huge amount of wealth from his family. He was a Yale graduate. He started campus prayers and, and, and Bible studies, he even served those in, in need there in the New Haven streets. He founded Yale Hope Mission. And William officially denounced all of his family fortune because he sold out for Jesus Christ and he wanted to reach Muslims for Jesus Christ. He was in Nashville, Tennessee one day, and he heard about Muslims in China. And he felt the calling through the Holy Spirit to start serving those people. And so one day, on December 17, 1912, he set sail for China. On his way there, he stopped in Egypt because he wanted to learn Arabic so he could minister to Muslims on his way to China. But while in Egypt, he contracted spinal meningitis. And William Borden died at the age of April, on April 9th, 1913. He was 25 years old. And the words on his grave describe his purpose and his passion for the kingdom of God and his passion for Muslims to come to know Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. And this inscription, Randy Alcorn said he couldn't get out of his mind. And here's what the inscription says on William's grave. Apart from faith in Christ, there is no explanation for such a life. And that's what I hope they'll say about me. And that's what I hope they'll say about you. Apart from faith in Jesus Christ, there is no explanation for such a life. Well, he left William's grave and all of a sudden Randy Alcorn showed up at King Tut's grave. King Tut died at the age of 17. He was buried with solid gold chariots all around him, thousands of gold artifacts, gold coffin, gold burial sites with another gold burial site inside of that pyramid. See, the Egyptians believed that you took all of your earthly stuff like gold and you can enjoy it for all eternity. Well, bad news is it just sits here. He just sat there until a guy named Howard Carter discovered it in the burial chamber of King Tut in 1922. That They hadn't been touched. All that gold had not been touched in 3,000 years. And Randy Alcorn thought about these two graves. Borden was obscure. Borden's grave was in a dusty road, had overgrown weeds, had littered with trash on top of it. Then you have King Tut's grave. King Tut has this unimaginable wealth, yet... Yet, Randy writes, I couldn't help but ask myself, where are these two men now? Where's William now? Where's King Tut now? One who lived in riches and called himself a king is in the misery of a Christless eternity. The other, Randy writes, lived a modest life on earth in service to the one true king, is now enjoying his everlasting reward in the presence of our Lord. Family, if you want to define how joyful life should be, don't think about where you want to be in three years or five years or 20 years. Think about where you're going to be in 100 years. Think about where are you going to be in 500 years. Where are you going to be in 1,000 years? Where are you going to be then? It's like the old pastor who said this many years ago. He says, you want to know how rich you are? You want to know how well off you are? You want to know how joyful you are? He said this, then add up everything up in your life that money can't buy and death cannot destroy. You want to know how joyful you're going to be as you go through a circumstance of life? Add up everything in your life that money can't buy and death cannot destroy. Church, that's the balance sheet of our life. And that's where joy comes from. Will you stand with me? Let me pray over you right now. Father God, we come before you, and Lord, we do not want to waste our one and only life that you've given us. We want to be joyful in this one life. And would you help us to pour into the eternal things that actually bring us joy? May we follow our model Jesus Christ, I mean Paul, who ultimately followed our biggest model, and that is Jesus Christ. Would you make our lives count for the sake of Jesus? Who has taken a hold of us through his grace? And may you empower us to live in such a way that a hundred years from now, people will say 
Apart from Jesus Christ, there is no explanation for such a life. Lord, I pray for all of us to realize this, that joy is not an accident. Lord, there's decisions we need to make right now. And the first decision many of us need to make is to run to you. Lord, we need to, we need to give our life back to you. Or right now, Lord, we need to give our life to you for the very first time. And I'm praying for everyone in this room right now who's lost, who doesn't know the joy of the salvation that can come in Jesus Christ. Not built on anything that we've earned, but built on a gift to the cross of Jesus Christ. Lord, may you water what's been planted and may joy prosper for eternity through your word. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Everyone said, amen. If we can be a blessing to you, why don't you come up here right now? We got our prayer team. They're up here waiting for you. You can fill out your prayer card and take it to the cross. As you guys online, hit the request prayer button, and we would love to pray for it. Whatever it is you need us to pray for, we're here for you. Why don't you come right now as we sing about that glorious day. Now it's buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn till I met him Now it's
Amen. Because of that, we have a life to live, and we want to save lives. And a lot of that has to do with this baby bottle drive. We're so appreciative of RC's generosity in helping First Coast Women's Services save the lives of babies, but also of moms, dads, grandparents. They receive salvation through this amazing ministry. So if you forgot to turn in those baby bottles, make sure you take them to the Connect Desk. And if you your first time here today, we'd love to meet you. Come to the Connect Desk. We'll say hi to you. We got a gift for you. You don't want to pass out, pass, not pass out on, pass up on, all right? You don't want to pass out. We don't want you doing that, especially the connection desk. All right, and on top of that, don't forget the chest of Joe Ash. Our goal is $200,000. we are almost at $240,000 So the chest of Joe Ash. God is good, church. And because of that, you're going to start making, we're already making improvements right here, and things are going to change around here this summer. I promise you that. You'll actually know where to park at, believe it or not. It's going to be awesome. Hey, isn't God good? Can we just give God the praise for the joy that comes from the Lord? He is our strength. Let's go be people of joy. Love you guys. See you soon. God bless.